Hello, this is Clint McDonald. I'm back with another Visual Basic tutorial in the tutorial series that I'm doing for Windows application development. In this tutorial, we're going to introduce a new concept, uh, again, a beginner concept of one-dimensional arrays. And so we're going to talk about what an array is, how we declare it, how we put values into it, what are some of the advantages of using arrays versus other structures, uh, and maybe a few tips and gotchas are included in there as well. So I'm going to start by bringing up Microsoft Excel just to sort of explain what we're looking at. So a one-dimensional array is a storage control that allows you to store a list of items. And those items can be of any data type. Um, the example we're using right here in Excel would be uh, an integer for representing student marks. And so what would happen here is that if I was to create an array, um, I could store these marks in a single control structure um, where I could store 10 marks in the control structure. And then I could iterate through them later on or loop through them or reference the fifth element in the array or those kind of things in order to determine things. So when we define an array, what we're going to do is we're going to define what's called the index number. And it's just a numeric sequence where you're going to have um, a counter, basically. And with arrays, these index numbers start at zero and go upwards. So to create an array that stores 10 numbers, you create an array of size 9 because the index starts at zero. And so let's go and look at that quickly in the code. Okay, so. I've created a form here, and this is for our structure, but I'll go in here and we'll look at um, some information. So this particular array, we're storing an array of strings, um, and we want to store six different color names. And so we're defining a, an array with a upper bound index number of five, which means we can fit six strings inside this array. Okay. And the parts of the array is the, the name of the array is in front of the brackets. Within the brackets, you put the index upper bound, so that's the 5 in this case. And reminder that an index is start at 0 and increment by 1. And then you put the as statement along with the type of array that you want to store, the type of information you want to uh, store. Now, each element in the array is completely independent of one another. We're making this one called color array, but that doesn't mean we have to put the names of colors in there. I can put my name in there. I can put um, my street address. I can put any string I want in there. So each independent element is different and can be different. However, they do have to be of the same type. So if I make a string array, all the elements must be strings. Um, but that doesn't make much sense. Usually we take arrays and we have information that's related to each other or a list of items that are all from the same location or, or whatnot. So there are several ways to declare the arrays. This is the simplest where we're just saying here's an array of length 6, um, but it has, it's starting with no values in it. Another way to declare an array is to actually create the array, but don't put an upper bound index number in here and therefore we define it as in integer, but we can immediately then define a, it as a new instance of that array and populate it with the values by a common separated list within curly braces. And so this is another way, and this is probably the most popular way to instantiate small, uh, fairly static arrays. Okay? Another way you can do it here is to, to do the exact same method and not put the new integer array in there. And this is why I don't really recommend that very much. Uh, I don't recommend it that much because it will run into issues later with trying to set values for something that hasn't been declared yet and those kind of things. So it's always best to instantiate your variables and classes and objects, etc., uh, by somewhere using the new uh, declaration. So one of the things that we can do is we, if we take go back to our color array, when we load our form, we can set the values of each individual color in the list like so. And just by putting in the index number in the brackets. 
So although these six variables look like they're related to each other, they're actually not. They're actually 100% independent of each other. The only things that again have to be the same, they have to be the same data type. So they all have to be a string. So I can put, instead of blue here, I can put Clint there. And instead of purple, I can put dog. Okay. So there's lots of different things that you can do as long as they're all strings. I'll put those back for my purposes here. So when we load the form, we populate this, this array, and you can see that those values get put in there. All right. So if we go to the form here, you'll see what I have is I have this update, and what it's going to do is it's going to take the values in the array and put and push them into the list box so that we can actually see them. So the idea here is when I click on update the loop, it's going to <coughs> it's going to uh, clear the items in the in the list box as it is. It's going to loop through, and I use index for my variable name. It could be any variable name, but for index equals zero to the length of the array minus one. Because remember, the length is six. There's six colors in there, but the upper bound of the indexes can only go to five. And so it's really important not to go past that um, upper bound of the index or you're going to end up with uh, array out of bounds errors. So then we're going to take the list box and we're going to use the items collection. We're going to add an item to that collection and we're going to add the color array index. So the color that we put in there. So if you look up here where we declared the colors here, you can see that I used integers for the index numbers. And as I loop through here, this index will increment from 0 to 5. So we're adding these colors in this order to the list box. So let's just run that quickly and see what happens. So as we run that, you can say we can see the update using the loop. And you can see that the six colors get put into the list box um, in the order in which we created them. So that's pretty cool. Another way that you can take an array value, a one-dimensional array, and pop and push it into a list box is to use the data source command. So on here I also have an update data source command here and I always set it to nothing first because if there's already stuff in there I need to blank it. So I'm going to set the data source property of the list box to my array and that allows us to in one line put the array into the list box and what we just have to be aware of is that it's going to put it in the order from index 0 to index of upper bound and that allows us also note here we don't have any brackets or anything but that still knows it's a color array if I mouse over you can see it's still a color array as a string array so the brackets right here the brackets after the string tell me that it is an array so if I do that we can start here and we'll use it in the data source and you can see it does the same thing so that's sort of the real the basics around arrays you have to actually get in there and use them in order to learn more about them but I'm going to show you a few little methods here alright so there are some properties of arrays you can use so for instance if you want to just get the value of one particular uh, element in the array you just specify its index number so if I was to say string equals color array 3, it's going to return yellow. And if you look here, color array 3 is yellow. Okay. We can also use an integer here to go color array dot get upper bound. And then the got up, the got up, get upper bound requires a, a dimension. And this is a one dimensional array, so it's going to be dimension 0. So the first dimension is zero, the second dimension is one, the third dimension is two, etc. But again, we're just dealing with one dimensional arrays here, so we're just going to use a zero. We can also get the length. So the length is a property of the array. So if I say color array length, it's going to give me six, even though the upper bound was five. Okay. You can use a clone function in there as well. This is a little bit more advanced right now, but as you can see, I'm declaring a new array of the same size and then I just said the new array is a clone of the color array and then I have to cast it back to a string array because clone creates a an array of objects so we have to cast that back to a string array so that's a little bit more advanced 
You can say int equals color array dot count, which is going to give you the number of elements in the sequence. So again, that's going to be the same as length in this case. And you can use index of. So it's like a little mini search. We're going to search in color array for the value purple, and it's going to return the index number. So if we go up here, we find purple, and index number is 4. So it's going to return a 4. All right. So some of the methods that we can use that are available within arrays is we use this, uh, this class called array. And so we're using the array class and the different functions and procedures and methods within that class. So for instance, we can sort an array. So we can say array.sort color array. So we put the name of the array actually in the, as a parameter as the, within the function sort. So just to prove that, show how this works, if we take, I'll shrink this up so we can see more. Um, if we take this line here, array of indexes, color array blue, that's going to return two because blue here is in the second index spot. If we then sort the array, it's going to sort it in alphabetical order, which then, if we ran the exact same command, well, in alphabetical order, blue is in fact the first one, so it's going to return to zero because blue will now be in index position zero. Okay. Um, you can also use a copy command here. So you put the source array, then you put the destination array, and then you say the length. So you don't have to copy the entire array, you can copy part of an array. Um, and that gives you a lot of flexibility for doing all kinds of different things. When you're writing applications, you never know what you're going to run into. So the more flexibility you have, the better. So just to show you a little bit about how the sorting works, on my form here I created a sort button and what the sort does is that all it does is sort the color array. Okay. So then because I have these two buttons to update the list box, so each one of these buttons both clear the, clear the list box and then repopulate it again. So if I do anything to the array in between, it will actually show us the changes. So let's run this. When we run it, it'll come up, and we can say, let's loop through, use items.add, and add our array to the list box. Now let's sort it. So we sort it. Now it doesn't do anything because I have to then repopulate the list box again. So if I now click update loop again, you can see the change in the array, and it's listed it now in alphabetical order. Caution to the wind here because you've now changed the order of the elements in the array. So if you have multiple arrays or other things that reference an index number in the array and you've resorted it, all the index numbers have now changed. So now you're going to have to use the value and array.index of and a little search there to find the index of what you're actually looking for. So sorting is great. Just make sure you're not interfering with any relationships you've built through the index numbers because the index numbers change obviously. We will have another tutorial on some more advanced array stuff and we will work and talk about 2D arrays in the next video. Thank you so much.